Welcome back, you beauties. Thank you so much for joining what could be the most important conversation concerning your child that you could have, certainly in their young development. This morning, we are addressing a pressing issue of school bullying. Now, recent tragic events like the stabbing of a 14-year-old pupil just outside Oakdale Secondary School and the story of Lucky uh, Matle Jane, a transgender teenager forced to leave school due to queerphobic bullying, highlighting the urgent need for action. These are just two stories that have come to light. There are so many, countless, that will never see the light of day. So joining us to shed some light on this matter are Lorraine Moko, a woman with 17 years experience as a social worker, oh, and Amy Davids, a school teacher and content creator who um, is so real, brings her personal experience with bullying to bear in some very authentic content. So thank you so much to both of you for being here to address something that is very difficult. Difficult for parents, even more difficult for our little children to have to deal with when we're not there to protect them. Um, a, a really challenging time for all parents when we look at how polarized the world is. We want to be setting a better example to young people, yet their true north that they are looking up to, world leaders, community leaders, pretty much most grown-ups are behaving badly at the moment. Mm -hmm. So how do we address this? Uh, maybe I can start with you, Amy. At the heart of these matters, it's great that we get so much focus, media attention when something bad happens, but we need to step in before that. What are we missing here? How do these moments come to bear, do you think? Oh, it's so difficult because um, we, we often teach kids how to what to do once it's already happened. But what, why aren't we stopping it before? What can we possibly do to stop it before? It's such a, a, a difficult topic to breach because it's also such a taboo thing. We don't want to yeah. talk about bullying. A lot of us were raised um, that, you know, you kind of suck it up. Yeah. Um, we were all... We put all... your concrete pants on and get yes. back out there. Yeah. Um, so w we need to put measures in place so that it it stops before it actually even happens. Yes, of course, there are going to be times when it does happen and then we need to step in and also um, help le teach, teach kids to have coping mechanisms, but we need to step in before. You, you are 100% correct. Uh, Lorraine, is this a bigger picture or is this a smaller picture issue in your mind? You've had vast experience working in this space. It is so complex, you want to just blame the bully but there is a reason why every child victimizes another child. And it is quite a complex thing. In your experience, your vast experience working in the space, where does this bullying mechanism first begin? Is it with the society, the socioeconomic? Is it with the individual? How have you been able to wrap your head around it through your work in this space? It's usually from the basic unit where the child comes from, from home. <laughs> and it escalates to school and even worse to when they get to university than to when they are at work. So you can see that it's not just a small thing that just starts here, it goes. And it's a cycle that keeps it's a cycle. repeating itself. So how then do we step in? We want to focus on parents now without being too judgmental because everyone again has a reason. It's easy to paint someone with a brush, but when you see the levels of desperation that people are going through, doesn't excuse it though. So where then do we step in? How do you address bullying in your space, Lorraine? Do you go to the parents? Do you work with the child? Do you work with the victim, the aggressor? What is that first step? It's a tricky one. You start first with the child and find out from them what has been happening. And usually those little ones will tell you this is happening at home. This is happening here at school. But for some, unfortunately, especially our teenagers, they will rather not tell at yeah. all. They're just not wired. They way. just don't want to. They believe that if they tell, then it's going to be a big issue. They are going to be bullied even more. 
I know right now a lot of parents terrified at the notion of their child being put in this situation, but the bottom line is it is going to happen. If your child is going into a complex social environment like a school represents, it is going to have very complex situations and emotions attached to that. How best do we empower our children to be able to stand on their own two feet? And when do we step in? We'll take this conversation a little bit further, but please weigh in. We'd love to hear voice notes. Hit us up on all of our social media platforms, especially if you have direct experience with this. Please share some of your insights. It's my feel-good show. Welcome back. As we cut to the heart of a very complex matter, continuing our discussion on school bullying, and I suppose it extends way beyond that in some cases, it's crucial for us to understand the profound impact it can have on individuals. In fact, on a social setting, and Lorraine Morco, a woman with 17 years of invaluable experience as a social worker, and then Amy Davids, a school teacher and content creator who has a very special connection to this narrative, join us to continue to unpack and hopefully to empower teachers and parents. I know we are speaking a lot today about empowering our kids to be able to stand on their, their own two feet and to be able to push back. Sometimes it's too much. Sometimes we need to intervene and we need to step in. Maybe, Lorraine, maybe I can start with you. When we look at the damage that can be done to a child and when the right time to step in as that caregiver, whether you're a parent or a teacher, when you are the custodian of that child, it's your responsibility to be aware. What damage can be done if this is left unchecked? We've spoken about that cycle returning. What is this doing to young people who are victims of bullying? The first thing the child will experience will be withdrawing. You will see them withdrawing from you, getting into depression, insomnia, where they can't sleep very well. And for you as a parent, you just think, oh, my child is being rebellious, doesn't want yeah, to sleep it's early. It's a teen, yeah. You know, little do you know that it's much deeper than that, then there is suicidal thoughts and action, meaning that the child can end up killing themselves because nobody's hearing them, nobody's attending to them, nobody's understanding what is going on. And we see it. Unfortunately, I wish this was being sensationalised, but we're actually underselling what's happening in our schools, happening within our communities in that sense. I know, Amy, you have a very deep personal connection to this and you have experienced bullying. You understand what this does within that set. What damage is done to a child's self-confidence in that space? And are, have you been able to identify a critical point to step in? Well, I think one of the biggest things is the doubt that a small piece of bullying yeah. can put into a child's mind that can just grow and grow and grow. Um, sometimes we think that bullying is overt, it's out there. physical action, yes. for sure. Um, and sometimes it's, it's, it's not that. It's that small little gnawing away, the little side comments. Constantly not being tagged in photos of your friends. Yes. It sounds ridiculous, but this is how it plays out. And what we don't realise is the effect that what we would necessarily see as something small for, for us not being tagged in a photograph. For sure. Not really the biggest thing in our minds as, as adults, but for a 13, 14, 16... When those four girls are your whole life, it's, it's a big it's thing. It's a big, big thing. Um, and something, as uh, once again, as small as, as not being tagged might not seem as big as pushing somebody down a flight of stairs. Yeah, you know, for It sounds sure. horrible, but um, it's not... We don't see the, that as a big thing, and that, for the child, it is a big thing. When do we step in? When do we, we see it? Because we don't necessarily think that that is such a big issue, we might, it might just go unnoticed to us. But it's there where the symptoms or the way that it presents itself, the lack of sleep, the, the, the depression, the withdrawal, that is where we as adults, teachers, parents need to step in and say, okay, something's not right. Let's speak up about this. Let's chat about it. Let's have a conversation. Let's start. And, and unfortunately, I think a lot of parents, you learn the hard way that that yeah. conversation needs to be going all the time. You can't go and retrospectively start communication with your child. They need to be comfortable to come to you. So we know that's part of the, the equation. What must it look like if I, as a parent, want to speak to my child about this, Lorraine, without triggering them, without making them feel more pressure or anxiety? How does that look? What do we do if we want to speak to our child about what they're going through. 
make it a normal conversation. Ask them, how was school? That question, how was school? What have you done today at school? Who did you hang out with today at school? Oh, the friends have changed. What changed here? What happened to that other friend that you had? So also getting to know who are the bodies in your child's life is very important. And to keep going with them if they are not... Because it's every week, it's every day, this conversation yeah. needs to happen because that in itself gives you the roadmap. You can see if they aren't connecting with you for the last two weeks, again, there's a reason. Maybe there's something that we Absolutely. need to look at um, under, underneath that. Um, I, it is difficult as a parent because I was just thinking this whole time, so often with schools, it's plug and play. It's like we're taking our school and just our child and plugging them into another matrix and thinking, ah, oh, it's not our job to parent them. And then we expect our teachers to just be able to do a parent's job while they've got 30 kids. But that being said, it is the teacher's responsibility to be able to. So as a parent and teacher, how do we together approach something like this? Because we don't want to turn our child into a pariah and have them ostracized or victimized the bully when there could be something more complex going on behind the scenes. How do we step in from the teacher-parent perspective, do you think? I think from, from a teacher's side, being able to see those warning signs, especially the early warning signs, which is very difficult in a class of 30, 35, and even bigger, we're talking about maybe sure. 45 kids in a class. How do you see things when you've got the curriculum to teach and lessons and extramurals, um, see those individual little symptoms? Um, but that is unfortunately the it's teacher's job. role. We have it's to job. step into, yeah. into that space. Um, when a teacher approaches a parent and says, listen, I think that there's something going on here. Let's have those conversations between parents and teachers. Um, parents, if you can get involved in your, your, your kid's school, um, your teachers are spending most of their day with your learn, well, I'm sorry, with your with kid. With your kids, yeah. Um, so when they say that there's something wrong, Maybe it's time that, Back them up, yeah. Yeah, that we listen and yeah, support, definitely. Um, well, you trust them with their educational development and you forget that bigger part of that process. We saw that with the, with the little gym this morning. Yes. It's all part of the same emotional process. These, there's a reason why we send our kids to school. It's to grow and develop, to become stronger and independent. But they are still within a matrix where they need our help and support. Mm. I'm going to say it right now. If you're a teen who is going through anything right now, the South African depression and anxiety group are neutral, non-judgmental. They don't know who you are. All they care about is helping you right now. So you can reach out, but most importantly, learn how to speak to your child parents. Start that conversation every day. We're going to continue this conversation in just a little bit. It's my feel good breakfast show. Welcome back as we wrap up our discussion on school bullying and we are exploring some practical strategies for prevention and support with Lorraine Moko, a, uh, an incredible human being with 17 years experience as a social worker and an equally incredible Amy Davids, a school teacher and content creator who thankfully is helping us to see the light. Uh, so Lorraine, I'm going to put this to you. What has worked? Maybe you can give us a couple of tips or an example of a situation that has worked where you've been able to turn the tide. What works is the, the, the idea of bringing your child into your world as a parent, but at the same time, getting into the world of that child. Mm -hmm. You must Be know. You, you, must, you know. must know that as they grow up, they are half you. They ah. learn everything from you as a parent. God help us all. And the same oh, goes yeah. with the teacher that as a teacher, they are looking up to that particular teacher. That, you know, it, it's that small, the way they write. Yeah. The handwriting of your child is influenced by the teacher. So the same, when it comes to issues of bullying, if you speak openly with them, they are able to speak openly back with, with you, you. Okay. and tell you exactly what is wrong, exactly what is happening. Because they'll start small by saying, I've got a headache. Mm. I've got my a tummy sore. sore. My tummy, tummy sore. sore. Yeah. I don't want to go to school. Uh. Those small things are, are, are the things that which you have to look out for and to really sit down with them, not with a judgmental eye, but to listen to them with a heart 
that I understand that it's painful to go to school. You've got to be at school. You know, the worst you can do is to say, stay home. Yeah. So encourage them to go. Don't As they go and come yeah. back, encourage them also to, to asking what happened at school today. You know, pay interest in their day-to-day -day activities. And that's something you've got to do. That, that credit you keep building every single day. I, and it's so funny, as you say that, I remember the best p reaction I've had from my son was not me telling him, but rather me asking him. I had an incident in the traffic that I couldn't let go of, where this guy had effectively bullied us in his car, and all I wanted to do was just run this guy down, get him out of his car, and explain to him, now listen, bud, how this actually... And I couldn't let go of it, and I asked for his advice, and we both changed through that process. So I get what you're saying. From a teacher's perspective, as the teacher and parent, now that we know, work together in the space in a non-judgmental way, what advice would you have for, for teachers and parents in the coalface right now dealing with an issue like this? I do think that the, the creation of those safe spaces, okay. um, especially within in a classroom, and yes, I know that sometimes, unfortunately, due to the packed schedule, the reality, yeah. um, it doesn't necessarily always afford itself those opportunities but if teachers can just create those opportunities or create opportunities where maybe a kid doesn't necessarily want to speak to me but know that they could come to me and say ma'am I don't really I've got an issue don't really want to talk to you about it who can I possibly go to um, so creating those those safe spaces um, are, are very important and um, us as teachers, we can do that, but as well as the parents, creating a space where, um, as Lorraine said, um, how was your day? Something as simple as that. Uh, and then looking for those, those warning signs, one of the things that I must say as a teacher that I've noticed is um, after first break, how many kids have now all of a sudden got a sore tummy? What mm. happened at first break? Why wasn't that sore tummy there in the beginning of the day? For sure. So looking at, at those little those patterns that start um, reoccurring and then, and then dealing with that. Um, uh, kids need to, to have those coping mechanisms, or we expect kids, sorry, to have those coping mechanisms. Who teaches them that? And, it's our duty. And, and they've got to see us doing that coping, if yes. we're going to just set it aside because it's not our problem, it's teachers, or it's not our problem, it's the parents, all they are modelling is that being swept under the carpet. Mm -hmm. And I like the fact that we can, we can talk to our children and say, well, would you rather speak to mom about this? Or would you rather speak to me? Because that just changes the tone, then they can, I don't want to speak to teacher, but I want to speak to my coach maybe, yeah. or something like that. I absolutely understand that. We've had some brilliant comments come through as well. So we're going to put those up now so we can have a little gander. Um, and thank you so much for bringing your comments to bear as well. Setu saying, my six-year-old has been bullied. What makes other kids bullies? Maybe we should start there. I absolutely love that. <laughs> So often, and I know it's the case at my son's school, where they, they look at both the bullier and the bully as a victim yeah. of something, mm -hmm. and whether it's a big or a small thing. But, but what is that thing, Lorraine, in your experience? Is it a moment? Is it a complete modelling of behaviour? Is it a, a behavioural trait that's just there? What is that thing that makes a bully a bully? For that age group, ask yourself, what is the age group of the bully? If the age group is within that age below seven, mm -hmm. the model is the parent. It's the parent. This what time. you see with the child is what the parent is usually doing. So you would want as a parent to go and confront the child, to go and confront the parent. But the best place to start is always where you've placed your child. If it's at an ECD, do inform them of the incident and request an audience with the parent okay. so that they can be assisted. But if you have to go to that six-year-old yeah. and say, you are bullying my child, you are going to break down that child forever. Okay. They will hate school forever. Oh, completely. And often an insecurity, bullying might be that insecurity, and the whole family might be insecure about something. It's just manifesting in different ways. I get that. Let's have another look here. We've had another beautiful and very well-stated um, comment come through from Farooza saying, does intimidation from teachers count as bullying, especially when schools have fundraisers and kids get promised uh, incentives so they're pressured to bring in multiple lists before due dates, kids go home and start throwing tantrums that they, um, they teach them more than they believe whatever their teacher says is law. It does not matter how much the parent explains, the child still believes the teacher has the last day. 
all I'm hearing from that comment is a complete disconnection between the teacher and parents mm -hmm. talking about each other as satellite stations. So I, I can certainly understand your anger and frustration at your child being put in that space. Mm -hmm. But that, again, doesn't speak to an individual villain. It speaks to a system that is defunct and broke it down. Um, Amy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it to you for, to save the world with one last comment. No, because you've made it your mission to put this message out there and help to coach and guide other people. So what's the mantra, the advice that you go back on? What do you keep telling yourself in this space? And what message would you like to put out there for other parents and teachers to really latch on to? In a, a summed up word, two words, be kind. Um, I think that the world will be such a better place if there was just a little bit more kindness from everybody. Now, kindness looks different for each person. For sure. Sometimes it, kindness can be, like the old people used to say, if you've got nothing nice to say, keep quiet. Yeah, just that step That is back. an act of kindness. Uh, kindness can be, my friend is sitting all by herself at break. I'm going to go and sit with him. Um, kindness can be, I, I'm seeing my daughter retract a little bit. Maybe I should look into this a little bit. So kindness, That's if we can just yeah. embody it, it will really, really help. Um, our kids are sitting on social media. Let's be honest, that's where they are. Let's use social media. It's such a powerful platform For to sure. create awareness around these topics, um, to empower our kids with um, coping mechanisms, with to empower uh, adults, sorry, to see what are the the, the symptoms. Life that are, hacks, man. Hundred yeah. percent. So let's let's use it to to our advantage. But at the end of the day, let's just be kind. Just be kind just to be ourselves, kind. to our teachers, to other parents, and most yes. importantly, let's be kind to our children. There is an expectation that they've got a full bag of tools to be able to deal with this complex world that we live in. That is not the case. They're as young as five, six years old. Mm -hmm. The onus on is on us to be the bigger person. It is a serious problem. We can tackle it together. I love that. Just for the rest of today, just be 